Putting a lid on oil production to raise prices. Half the world's producers met in Qatar's capital to talk about restricting supply. Some stayed away, so do the talks matter? And what are the risks if production levels are not capped? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. It is in almost everything we use, from the screen you're watching this on to the toothbrush you used this morning. And while consumers benefit through lower petrol prices and energy costs, leading oil producing nations are suffering from the dramatic fall in the price of oil. Our ministers have been meeting here in Doha to discuss a possible production freeze. They hope lower output will cause prices to rise and revive government budgets which rely on oil revenue. Ministers met against the backdrop of rising tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran who don't see eye to eye on much, including oil production levels. So will the production freeze go into effect? And even if it does, will it have the desired effect for oil producing nations? A lot to discuss with our guests, but first, Bernard Smith sets up the story for us. This meeting in Qatar comes after one also held here in Doha back in February. Then, Saudi Arabia, Russia, Venezuela and Qatar agreed in principle to the idea of freezing oil production at January levels in the hope that would at least stabilise the price of oil. Back then, oil was around $30 a barrel or just below, and since that meeting, the price of oil has gone up to around $40 a barrel, and around 60% increase. So this, agree, uh, this meeting was essentially to try and seal the deal on what they'd agreed in February. But missing from the picture is Iran. Now Iran says it doesn't really, it's not prepared to freeze production because it's only just had sanctions lifted. And already in March, Iran was producing 400,000 barrels a day of oil more than it was in January, and the Iranians say that they want to get production up to a million dollars a barrel. So the Iranians have not been taking part in this meeting in Doha. But all the oil producing countries have been feeling the pain in the drop in the price of oil, and all of them are interested in some, in some mechanism that will help stabilize the price of oil. Bernard Smith for Inside Story in Doha. Uh, Iran's oil minister likened the production freeze to self-imposed sanctions. The Doha meeting is for those who want to sign the plan to reduce output. If we wanted to send someone, it would have been to show support for the decision. But as we are not going to sign anything, and as we are not part of the decision to freeze output, we ultimately decided it was not necessary to send a representative. We can't cooperate with them to freeze our own output, and in other words, impose sanctions on ourselves. Our countries hope the production gap will help Global oil, oil prices rebound from their dramatic fall. In mid-2014, oil prices were around $100 a barrel. In January, they had plunged to around $30 a barrel. And the price drop has been good news for consumers who've enjoyed cheaper petrol prices while airlines have saved billions of dollars in fuel costs. It is the opposite story, though, for oil-producing countries, especially Nigeria and Venezuela. Their economies have been devastated by low oil prices, which are also squeezing wealthy Gulf states, too. The oil producers are hopeful about the impact of a production freeze. Prices have already been boosted in anticipation. Well, for more on this, let's bring in our guests. Kamil El Harami joins us from the meeting in Doha. He is an independent oil analyst in London. We have Cornelia Meyer. She is an oil and gas specialist and CEO of Meyer Resource. And lastly, John Svakianakis joins us from Riyadh. He is the director of economics research at the Gulf Research Center. Good to have you all uh, with us now, Mr. Kamil uh, Harami. Let's start with you since you are uh, where it's all happening there. What is the sense that uh, you're getting out of these meetings and and what, what do you uh, expect to emerge from it? I, I sincerely hope that we will have um, uh, an agreement, a uh, communique from, uh, from the, the producers uh, later on today or maybe immediately that they will call for a freeze on the production level of January of this year. 
a follow-up meeting in October in Moscow, and a monitoring committee consisting of two members of OPEC and two of non-OPEC. This is, this is the, the best, I think, the best scenario we should envisage or we can envisage so in order to give uh, a signal and to strengthen oil prices to maintain its strength, uh, to maintain its stability at the level, at the $40 level and above, hoping to reach 50 by the end of the year. This is, this is a very important uh, element. This is very important. This is very crucial to all producing countries. Non-agreement, it really would lead to collapse of oil prices early morning tomorrow in Asian market in, uh, uh, on Monday, and then it will linger to other countries, to Europe, uh, to continent, to Europe, and to America. So it is it's, it's very cru uh, imminent, it's important to have a communique, a positive communique uh, from the people that are countries gathering today in Doha. Cornelia Meyer, how do you see this, and 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 what impact will will Iran's position have uh, on this? Them saying that uh, that they don't want any part of of uh, oil production freezes right now. Well, I'll first go to Iran and then I'll go to the ma macro picture. Iran, it, well, you can understand Iran, they want to up their production by a million barrels a day. I don't think they'll do it as quickly as they thought they will, but they will, they will up the production because they say, we've had sanctions, we need to do something now. You can understand the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia who says, look, it, we only agree to a freezing production at January levels if all OPEC members and all the big other producers are in there because the kingdom frankly has had bad you know got quite bruised in 2008 when OPEC decided to cut production the kingdom adhered to the cut in production everybody else um, didn't really cut production and they were sort of as we say in England left holding the baby so it makes sense for them in order to protect market share to say unless Russia and all the big OPEC nations agree and adhere to it it doesn't make sense now to the meeting and the impact on price I think in the short run yes um, uh, our colleague in Doha is right. Um, it will impact on price because it's very psychological if they cooperate or don't cooperate. Materially, I don't think it will matter that much because what is happening is that we see all, uh, the shale oil production in, um, in the US coming off. We also will see as uh, so many international oil companies have invested much, much less money, $500, million, $500 billion less over the last 12 months only, that you will see less production. So you will see the production, you will see production going down, which will then in the end eat into the storage. And the IEA has forecasted last week that um, uh, on Wednesday that in, the, in their oil report that they see that they see the picture turning and that we will we will see less overproduction and actually as of second half of this year we will see um, uh, the, the uh, we will see a de deceleration of, of accumulation of stock and even a, a lowering of the stock levels. John Svakianakis, uh, your take on this and and could Iran's decision to uh, stay home dilute the impact of any potential agreement here? I think that uh, the market understands clearly that uh, at this point, Iran is not going to be participating because there are uh, maximizers of supply. So clearly, knowing that Iran is not going to participate, last Friday, we didn't see a significant sell-off in oil. Actually, oil dropped initially by 3% when they announced the Iranians that they're not joining, and then it closed by 1% or thereabouts down. So I think the market is pricing in quite well that Iran is not going to participate. Secondly, I think that there's going to be some kind of a consensus. And there's going to be a consensus where eventually Iran will have to participate. For the time being, all the OPEC and non-OPEC countries agree that they have to show that there is some kind of uniformity in view and opinion. Thirdly, and definitely, we're seeing that supply is less in the global market, and that is quite important because in the second half of the year, we're going to see also demand picking up a little bit, especially from places like China. The Chinese growth story is going to be more positive. As a result, we will see oil prices 
going upwards and the supply issue is going to help that story. So I think there are a confluence of indicators that are helping the countries that are meeting in Doha to appear more consensus oriented. At the end of the day, Saudi Arabia does not want to see oil in the 20s, nor does Venezuela and Nigeria, which is really suffering. Kamil Harami, um, I mean, we mentioned there that uh, this, this idea of uh, the, the, the prices of, of freezing production was, was something that was uh, first floated back in uh, February. And since then, prices have risen just on that talk. So even if they don't come to, to any kind of formal agreement on this, just the fact that they're still talking about uh, freezing prices at some point in the future, might that continue to, to, uh, to, to bring prices up? Yeah, yes, but, but it is essential because what I'm saying is that what if there is no agreement, if there is no uh, adherence, then it becomes a useless meeting. So it becomes an exercise. And, I, and, I, and I, we don't want to see an exercise. We want to see something tangible. Regardless of Iran and its noises, Iran is always making noises. And they know the Iranian. They cannot increase their production all of a sudden. It's going to take time. And so why don't you give the time? That will take. Iran will get its share, but not at this moment. So why is they are making the noises? But coming back to, as I said, it is essential. It is very important that we end up with a communique. Failure is not, is not on the board. It shouldn't be there on the table today, not tomorrow. I think we are, we are now we have three days, and we've been preparing for this meeting since February. So I think we should have done our homework, and we should reach a very uh, nice uh, communique, very nice compromise from all participant, participants in this meeting today. Cornelia Meyer, I mean, John mentioned there the, the, the impact of, of China and China's economy has been slowing down quite a bit of, over the last uh, couple of years. And it is one of the, the, the biggest uh, consumers of, of oil. Just looking, taking a more long term view of this, what impact uh, w will that have on, on oil prices overall, regardless of what, what the, these oil producing nations decide? Well, there's two things. One, China will keep on producing. There's a lot of the growing middle class will want cars. This will be gasoline powered cars. Um, so, so yes, they will keep on producing. I always say oil is an, an OPEX com commodity, not a CAPEX commodity. So you need it for day to day operations. The other thing is don't forget India. Um, India has India's um, consumption rose year on year 16%. Gasoline consumption was up 21%. So India is really a big, big factor there as well. So yes, demand from emerging markets will grow, the Turkish, the Indias. Um, also, the supply is coming down. You know, the underinvestment in, from the international oil companies of $500 billion um, in 12 months. That will eat its way into production in between, you know, um, a, 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 a dollar invested today it results in a barrel produced in three to, to 10 years. Uh, you also have the shale oil production coming down markedly. Um, uh, um, this, this, this month, um, the U.S. only produced less than 9 million barrels. They were at 9.5 million barrels only in January. So you see production coming off and you see um, consumption going up, which is good for the oil price. Also, the, um, uh, um, when you see uh, when you, uh, w what has been depressing the oil price a little bit was a, was a very high dollar, because usually the high dollar results in a low oil price. So if we see the dollar coming down a bit, that will be a good effect as well. Well, let's just take a step back and, and put this in, in some perspective uh, and understand what, why oil prices are so important. Because oil fuels our economy as well as cars, ships, trains, planes, but it also reaches into our daily lives in ways we rarely think about. One barrel of oil creates around 75 liters of gasoline. The rest, about half, produces many different things. It's in everything from computers to furniture and clothing. It's also in personal products such as toothpaste, shaving cream and cosmetics. And you may think the only connection that oil has to your car is the petrol you put in the tank. But many car tires are made from synthetic rubber produced from oil. In fact, the average tire is made using around 30 liters of oil. Now, even 
The roads you drive on use materials made from oil. Asphalt is a semi-solid form of petroleum. The petrochemicals are in food, preservatives, flavorings and colorings. Vast amounts of oil and gas are also used to make fertilizers and pesticides and plastic in everything from food packaging to how your smartphone is made, which is from chemicals as well. So that gives you an idea of, of the kind of uh, impact uh, that what we're talking about right now uh, has on, on the whole uh, global market. But John, uh, if I could turn back to you uh, on this, I mean, is, is, it, is it necessarily such a bad thing if the price of oil goes down, particularly for uh, consumers, uh, you know, and motorists and so on, and, and uh, there are energy bills, all, all of that sort of thing? But I think it's, it's good news, relatively speaking. Of course, it helps when the global economy has been slowing down and there are concerns about the recovery. Uh, we are over the, uh, the IMF meetings in Washington where there is concern that has been signaled by the IMF about the so-called uh, recovery since the global financial crisis. So low oil prices have felt, but at the same time, there are certain countries like Nigeria, Venezuela, and others that are in near bankruptcy, if not have bankrupted. So that is of concern. And definitely for the Gulf oil states, uh, a post-oil era, I would say, is a good thing. It is good that oil prices have reached 40 $45 a barrel for them to think about their future at a time when they really need to do economic reform. Saudi Arabia has been strategically thinking about these very important questions, especially as a result of what has been stated over the last three weeks from the Deputy Crown Prince, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, of a Saudi Arabia that is thinking of its future. And I think this is going to translate within the rest of the Gulf countries, Kuwait, the UAE. And, and it is important that they're doing it now rather than later. So I think it is an advantage for the consumer countries, but it is also an advantage, loyal prices, for the producing countries to think of themselves after. And I think Saudi Arabia is at the focal point and it is leading the way in many ways. Yeah, what's your uh, view on this, uh, uh, Kamil Harami? I mean, what does it say about uh, Saudi Arabia's uh, economic situation right now and, and, and its, its finances that they are now or have been for the last couple of months talking about freezing uh, production? Because in the long run, oil prices at this level, the longer they go on, are not going to be good for uh, Gulf nations like Saudi Arabia, are they? Yes, that's right. Uh, certainly, yes. And, uh, and as, as I, uh, I will say also that uh, the oil prices, even though it's going to go to the $50 level, uh, level, but it should maintain, you know, we should maintain a level of between uh, 55 to 60 or maybe perhaps 65 because you don't want to again to, to alarm or to trigger uh, production of shale oil. Therefore, therefore, as you said, we have to take other steps in order not to rely solely on oil. And it is time maybe to think, to really, to, to think out of the box. It is time. The Saudis are doing things, uh, the Kuwaitis should do other things. Now, now it is time to, whether we liquidate, whether we privatize, we have to generate more cash into the country into, from our own assets. This is, this is the way it should, be, it should be done. It's a long process, but however, if oil prices keep uh, at the level of 55, 65, we should be able to manage. And in the meantime, we have to borrow and we have to uh, cash and sell our overseas investment. But however, we have to look at it on long term. I do not see oil prices now reaching the level of 70 or 80 in the very near future, not, not in the next five years, because the threat of shale oil will always be there, whether it is from America and from other countries in the world. Cornelia Meyer, we mentioned there earlier about how uh, the poorer oil producing nations like Venezuela and uh, Nigeria are really feeling the pinch here over these continued low oil prices. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are desperate, aren't they, to get those prices uh, back up to, to more sustainable levels for them, like over $100 a barrel. I mean, how, how much of an impact is, is all of this having on them? 
Well, it's having a big, huge impact. And don't forget Russia either. I mean, Russia's missed sort of a trick in not diversifying its economy more when the going was good and oil prices were so high. Um, Venezuela with huge subsidies in there, they're, they're really hurting. Um, Nigeria is really hurting. Yes, those are the really hardest hit. And you, but you saw on the other side, on the flip side, that a lot of countries like Indonesia and, and India got rid of who are not oil producers, but they got rid of a lot of the subsidies when it hurt less. And so made, made a more a better thing, as does Saudi Arabia now. And you see that the Gulf producers, they can go on for quite a bit because they sit on reserves. Um, and um, they also have debt capacity. They, they, they're not like Western governments who have so much debt. But you always see when oil prices are low, um, countries like Saudi Arabia and, and, and UAE and so on take the right macroprudential measures. Also, you see that the kingdom, Saudi Arabia and UAE markedly, they, they are really starting to think of the post oil era. I just came back from the UAE and every se second sentence was the post oil era. John, I, I mean, we, no one's been talking up to this point. Uh, I mean, we've, we're hearing a lot about uh, freezing oil prices, stabilizing, stabilizing the output and so on. But no one is talking seriously about cutting production at this point. Do you think that will change at, uh, at any time? I mean, wh why is that? I think in many ways Saudi Arabia has indicated that what it has been producing since January, which is at the same level as they are producing now, is basically going to be Saudi Arabia's response to a cutting freeze. Um, and so uh, this is what the, the agreement should look like of uh, Saudi Arabia producing around uh, 10.4 million barrels a day, as it did in January, and for Russia, around uh, 10.9 or thereof. And I think that um, the, the most important thing is that there is agreement as to the extent of this freeze so that we don't see an increase. And most importantly, uh, in the past, we've seen that there has been an agreement, but then a lot of countries have violated this agreement. So the most uh, fundamental issue here is that there is consensus. And secondly, that very few countries, if, if possible none, actually do not violate this. And, and Saudi Arabia, I think, has led the way in indicating since January that this is going to be the acceptable level and this is how it's going to be. Well, let's, let's talk more about that then. Uh, Cornelia Meyer, I saw you, you, you nodding to, to, to some of what you heard just there. Uh, if, some of, if some of these countries choose to kind of go their own way, there, there are no enforcement mechanisms here, are there, for anyone to stick to what's agreed in Doha? Well, no, there aren't. And it's, it's even worse than with, within OPEC. Within OPEC, we have no real enforcement mechanisms. Um, but there you have the non-OPEC producers as well. But I think, you know, if you look at it, the, the, the 10.4 million barrels and the uh, um, 10.9, 11 million barrels from Russia, um, they are they are they are really at an all time high. So this is this is quite this is quite acceptable, and really I think we will we the oil consumers will at some stage be very grateful for those levels because you will see um, the production coming off from the from the from the international oil companies and all the people who have been under investing. The only people who kept their investment patterns in the industry up were the GCC producers. One final and quick question to you, uh, Camille El Harami. Just in the short term, what do you see coming out of, uh, of these meetings in Doha? Firstly, we have to agree. You have to agree that the moment we're freezing production, that means we are cutting the production. The outcome, I hope, uh, it is we are in the final minutes. I think it's going to be a communique, positive communique, to pass a positive uh, message to the oil markets, to pass a positive market positive message to the oil prices tomorrow morning in Asia and Europe and America. Yeah, it'll be certainly very interesting to see what the, uh, the global markets make of all this when they do open uh, on Monday. Good to have you all uh, with us. Uh, we're going to have to bring the discussion to an end here. Thanks very much for being on Inside Story. Kamal El Harami, Cornelia Meyer and Thank John Svakianakis. Thanks very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching. As always, uh, you can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, if you're interested, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash 
AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle, AJ, at AJ Inside Story. For me, Hazem Seeker and the whole team here. Bye for now.